Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Director of Science, Medicine, and Public Health, Andrea Garcia in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Andrea, uh, coming off a holiday weekend, I'm just going to guess and say this is not where we thought we were going to end up this summer. Um, what do you see in terms of the latest statistics and the outlook uh, for us going into the fall season. Thanks for having me, Todd. And, and that's right. You know, we know summer began with a huge drop in COVID cases in the U.S. and the real hope that the worst of the pandemic was behind us. And we're now ending this season with increasing deaths, full hospitals, and I think the realization that this virus is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. And while vaccine rates are ticking upward, the reports of new infections are starting to fall in some of those really hard hit Southern states. Um, but really Labor Day weekend bears little resemblance to Memorial Day when the country was averaging fewer than 25,000 cases daily, or even the 4th of July when President Biden spoke about nearing independence from the virus. So right now we're seeing more than 160,000 new cases a day and about 100,000 COVID patients hospitalized nationwide, and more than 1,500 Americans are dying most days. That's worse when case, than when cases surged last summer, but it's still far lower than the winter peak. I'm going to assume that the fact that we are below the winter peak of last year is due to the power of the vaccines. Uh, is that explain where we are right now? Yeah, vaccines are effective in preventing severe disease and death, but we know that 47% of the U.S. population is not fully vaccinated, and that is really allowing the Delta variant more than enough opportunity to inflict suffering and disrupt our daily lives. Health officials still say that most of the patients who are being hospitalized and who are dying are not vaccinated, and that it's the unvaccinated population that is driving the current surge which we know is overwhelming our healthcare system. And I know that, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on how you look at it then, but uh, the surges, you know, it's in addition raised some questions about uh, the waning immunity among the vaccinated. We did speak with our ACIP liaison, uh, Dr. Sandra Freihofer last week about boosters and the, that 17, uh, excuse me, that's uh, September 20th date that the administration gave for offering them to the general public. You know, at that time, she told us that the, the data uh, was currently under review and we need to wait for FDA approval and an ACIP and CDC recommendation. Looks like that situation might be changing. What do you, where are we on the booster situation? You know, I think that's still the case. And, and in response to this, we know federal health officials have asked the White House to scale back their plan to offer booster vaccines to the general public on September 20th. And they're saying that regulators really need more time to collect and review all the necessary data. On Sunday, the White House chief of staff said it will only offer boosters once federal regulators have, have offered their support. His exact words were, I wanna be absolutely clear, no one's going to get boosters until the FDA says they're approved or until the CDC advisory committee makes a recommendation. Prior to that, last Thursday, Dr. Woodcock, the acting commissioner of the FDA, and Dr. Walensky, the head of the CDC, told the White House that their agencies may be able to determine in the coming weeks whether to recommend boosters, but only for recipients of the Pfizer vaccine and, and po possibly just some of the population to start. But that being said, over the weekend, we heard Dr. Fauci say that any delay in clearing the Moderna booster <laughs> would be only a few weeks later at most. Regulators are really just beginning to review critical data that will help them determine how to proceed on the issue of boosters. So we're in a bit of a wait and see mode for now. We know that FDA's advisory committee is meeting on September 17th to discuss the Pfizer data and the ACIP meeting dates have yet to be posted. And hopefully that will uh, bring some more clarity to the situation. You know, on top of that, we have some health uh, experts that are still arguing that before we start trying to emphasize boosters for vaccinated people, we should still be putting in more effort to get uh, uh, to reach more of the unvaccinated population. You know, as you mentioned, 47% uh, of Americans are still not fully vaccinated. Where, where do we stand on vaccinations as of this week? 
So about 950,000 vaccine doses are being administered each day. That's up from a low point about, of about 500,000 doses per day in late July. 206.9 million people or 62.3% have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And that includes about 176 million people or 53% who've been fully vaccinated. The CDC is also reporting that more than 1.3 million fully vaccinated people have received an additional primary dose since August 13th. That's the day after the FDA opened up eligibility for third doses for some people with weakened immune systems. And I'm going to uh, guess that the states with kind of the lowest vaccination rates are probably the ones that are seeing the most significant surges. Uh, is that what you're seeing out there? That's right. And, you know, Kentucky made news over the weekend as the governor there called the situation dire. Uh, the state recorded a seven day average of 4,423 new, new daily cases on Saturday. Deaths and hospitalizations have been rising there too. And we know that about a fifth of Kentucky school districts have had to close temporarily because of COVID infections since classes began last month. And we were reading about uh, Governor Bashir and you know, uh, a lot of the flexibility you had to make decisions have been kind of hands tied by the legislature there. And it you know, just points to the fact that politics have played a big role there. Uh, we'll actually be talking to Dr. Stephen Stack, former AMA president, and now the commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Public Health uh, about what's going on uh, in Kentucky, how they're handling that. And uh, you know, in addition to that, we are also continuing to hear about a shortage of ICU beds across the country. Any updates there? Yeah, Oregon and Idaho have joined the list of US states that are running out of ICU beds. Um, as they confront a surge in new infections. The Oregon Health Authority reported on Saturday that only 50 of the state's 638 ICU beds were available. And in a statement last week, Idaho's governor said that just four of the state's nearly 400 beds were still open. When we look at the national picture, we know that the Delta variant has filled hospitals in many states. When we look at the HHS data, only a handful have more than 30% of their overall ICU beds still available. And many like Oregon and Idaho have less than that. And we know that this means hospitals are once again approaching really difficult scenarios and, and having to decide who can be treated and who cannot. And that is really concerning because we're at a pretty vulnerable time with uh, kids going back to school, colleges uh, starting up uh, as well. Um, you know, there are a couple of new studies that have been released by the CDC confirming uh, that what we've been hearing, which is pediatric hospitalizations due to COVID uh, increased uh, a bit over the summer. Can you tell us what we're seeing right now? Yeah, the new studies, as you said, have confirmed the upward trend of children being hospitalized for COVID. One of the studies from looked at data from late June to mid-August and the hospitalization rates in the U.S. for children and adolescents increased nearly five-fold, although they remain slightly below that January peak. The study also showed the same thing we found in adults, and that is vaccination does make a difference. Can you talk a little bit more about the details of that? What do we, what do we see? Yeah, so during the summer wave, the hospitalization rate was 10 times as high in unvaccinated adolescents as in those who were vaccinated. According to a second study, pediatric hospital admissions were nearly four times as high in the states with the lowest vaccination rate as compared to those in the highest vaccination rates. Uh, the study also found that COVID-related emergency room visits among children were more than three times as high in the states with the lowest vaccination coverage compared to the states with the highest vaccination rates. So I think these findings really underscore the importance of community-wide vaccination to protect children. Any other kind of key takeaways? You know, what does this mean? Yeah, so it's difficult to determine causality from the numbers. We still don't know if the increase in hospitalizations are because Delta is more severe or if it's because it's more transmissible. And we know that these increases could also be in, in part due to other factors such as masking. We do know that the weekly rates of pediatric hospitalizations have been climbing since July. Those rates have increased the most sharply for children who are age four and younger. 
With all that being said, based on the limited data available, it doesn't appear that the Delta variant is affecting the incidence of severe disease or death among children, which have been somewhat steady, steady and relatively low throughout the pandemic. Uh, and lastly, uh, ivermectin continues to be a, a, a pretty hot topic. The AMA issued uh, some pretty strong statements about ivermectin last week. Will you just uh, give an example of what that looked like? Yeah, so last week the AMA released a joint statement with the American Pharmacists Association and the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. That statement strongly opposes the ordering, prescribing, and dispensing of ivermectin to treat COVID-19 or prevent COVID-19 outside of a clinical trial. We know that ivermectin has not been approved by the FDA for use in preventing or treating COVID-19, and the statement urges physicians, pharmacists, and other prescribers to warn patients against the use of ivermectin outside of FDA-approved indications and guidance. I would also add that we know the veterinary forms of this medication are highly concentrated for large animals, and they pose a significant toxicity risk for humans. And uh, for those of, uh, of you who are interested in hearing more about ivermectin, we're going to have uh, Dr. John Farley, a physician from the FDA, on tomorrow's COVID-19 update. Uh, in the meantime, Andrea, thanks for being with us here today and sharing your perspective and the latest trends. We'll be back soon with another COVID-19 update. And for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.